Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Becky Edwards. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Chief Communications Officer at the ACLU. June 24th, earlier this year, was a shameful day in US history when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, eliminating the constitutional right to abortion. In the days and now months that have followed, it's understandable to sit with our anger, despair, outrage, and especially as states across the country are rolling back access to abortion care. In recent weeks, we've seen access shuttered in Indiana, Kentucky, Oklahoma, Tennessee, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. The fight ahead is daunting, but we have no alternative but to fight back together. We've organized today's leadership forum to draw inspiration from two countries' fights for gender justice and reproductive freedom, and two dates to hold as our North Stars, December 30th, 2020, when Argentina's Senate passed a law that allows abortion up to the 14th week of pregnancy, and May 25th, 2018, when the Irish people voted by 66% to remove its Eighth Amendment, which effectively banned abortion. Yes, these countries have unique political, social, economic, and religious factors that came into play, but we're hoping to lift up universal strategies and lessons learned, and frankly, give us all a much needed jolt of hope. That's why I'm so excited for today's conversation and I'm honored to be joined by four phenomenal activists. I have with me today, Victoria Tessariero from Buenos Aires, Alva Smith joining us from Dublin, Catherine Zapone joining us from New York, and the ACLU's own JJ Strait joining us from Colorado. We're so thankful for you all joining us today. All right, I'm gonna pose a question to each of you and that'll give us a chance to also introduce you to the, to the discussion. So I, I'll start with you, Victoria. How do you define your role in the abortion rights movement? Hello, how are you? Um, my pleasure to be here today. And I have many, many roles uh, organizing the mobilizations on the streets, trying to talk with different organizations to join our, our fight uh, for legal abortion. And in the last years, I was in the group who think about uh, the parliament strategy to join, to, to make um, the bill possible in the Congress. Fantastic, and I understand you've been in this move in this fight for a long time. Yes, around um, we took 15 years of national campaign for legal abortion to legalize abortion, but the struggle in my country took decades. And mm -hmm. I started to be an activist at the age of 18, so 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, right. It's a long trip. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Same question to you, Alba, and then you, um, Catherine. Um, you know, I'm just uh, identifying with Victoria there and thinking, you know, our struggle for abortion in Ireland goes way back. And I first became involved in the late 1970s. And um, that was when we began to, mid-70s, when we began to ask for the right to choose. But of course, mm -hmm. we had a referendum in 83, which inserted a complete ban on abortion into the constitution. So it was at that point that I became an activist, uh, a pro-choice, pro-abortion activist, and really have had to, you know, stay in that role for a very long time, for oh, well over 35 years, going on for 37 years. And finally, as you said, we, we did achieve a victory, but of course the battle is never entirely over. We're still fighting for more comprehensive rights. So I envisage another 10 years before we get that. That's fine. Yeah, you know, okay. We're used to it. We're, we're going to we're we're carry gonna, on. We're going to give each other strength. Um, yes. Catherine, how about you? Uh, I'm so pleased to be here with you, uh, ACLU, you know, uh, Americans and you all 
gave us such a uh, great hope. And I learned a lot from you in my own involvement in, in, in the right, in the rights movement for abortion. Uh, I landed in the country in the early eighties. I started uh, in my involvement was as a feminist theologian. I was teaching in Trinity college and in other public settings um, and teaching texts such as our right to choose towards a new ethic of abortion. Um, I also was appointed a human rights commissioner. Uh, later on, we gave advice to government. It just so happened that the primary pro-life leader of the move there on the other side of the movement was also on the commission. Um, and so when we had to give advice on these issues, it often contained both sides of the argument. Um, I was an activist as well, especially in, in, in the uh, period when myself and my late spouse uh, took a case against the Irish state because they wouldn't recognize our Canadian marriage as a lesbian couple. We led the marriage equality movement for many years with my great friend Alva um, and uh, for 15 years and our campaigning strategies and tactics, many some of them were adapted and amended in, in the repeal campaign. I suppose finally my role shifted about again in 2016, I was elected to political office. I became a member of the Irish cabinet. Um, and in this role, I constantly worked on behalf of re reproductive freedom and I'll be talking about that later. Hmm. All right, and you JJ, can you tell us a little bit about your role and also how the ACLU is situated in this fight? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I want to echo that I am just so pleased to be with this amazing uh, group of activists and leaders um, from across the world. Um, how incredible. Uh, so uh, I, too, came to activism very young personally um, and have worked in um, reproductive rights, labor rights um, and LGBTQ rights here in the U.S., um, working for a lot of great organizations um, and had always wanted to uh, be part of the ACLU. And now I get to sit in this amazing organization that's really part of a broad coalition um, of organizations and individuals who, you know, just like you all have said, I wanna note that in the US, this you know, wasn't settled in 1973 either. We have been at the forefront of continually battling for our very rights and equity um, uh, and bodily autonomy. Um, I was born in 1973 actually. And so I, I feel like um, I, I can go back to that date. Um, and, and certainly my mothers and foremothers before me fought to get to that date, but that date uh, and all the work I've done since the early nineties was really to continue to preserve access. It's one thing to say we have the right, but we have been fighting for actual access um, pretty much my entire adult life and, and, and across, it sounds like our countries forever. And the ACLU is a four leader on that fight, uh, both at the legal front um, and certainly with our amazing activists and volunteers um, and our amazing 50 state uh, plus Puerto Rico and Washington DC network of affiliates who are literally on the front lines every day um, looking at how we can make sure that everyone who wants to uh, have access to full health care can have it in this country. Okay, I'm already feeling the glow of being surrounded <laughs> by all of you. I, I, I mean, it's clear that um, activism can take many forms and it's important that it does, but it's also clear that there are like threads of continuity, right? You, you each spoke to some, some feeling of, you know, being committed as if this is a lifetime pursuit and a passion that, you know, you, has changed many forms over over your lifetimes and, and it will probably continue to do so. So it's important, you know, that we come together and recognize this is a global movement. Um, we are all interconnected. And in order to stay sustained and resilient, it, we need to share stories and share the tactics and strategies, what worked, what roadblocks did we face and how did we break through them in Buenos Aires so that we can learn how to do it in Dublin and, and vice versa. And um, today's discussion, we're gonna organize it around um, the major themes or lessons learned. So for the first segment, we'll explore how the nationwide movement might've involved decades of planning and work, but they all had a spark. And I'd like to start this discussion with Alva and Victoria. Um, so the wins in Ireland and Argentina were the results, as, as you both said, of decades long activism mm -hmm. and movement building, which we'll discuss later on. 
But there were turning points, right? When, when these yeah. movements ignited into a kind of unstoppable force. So maybe if I could start with you, Alva, from an activism standpoint, what was the turning point for the movement? What was the spark that really rallied the masses? Okay, well, I think that's a really important question. You're so right about the turning points, sometimes for good, sometimes for ill, but you can always do something with them, which is what I say to my sister or brother campaigners in the US, you can always do something with the turning point. And I think for us, certainly in Ireland, and bearing in mind that we had had a series of referendums from 1983 onwards, roughly every decade. So every decade, 1983, 1992, 2002, we were being dragged back to the wrong question about abortion. In other words, how not to have it, how to make it even more restricted. Um, and we were getting, we were weary and the people were weary and activists were weary. So when there was an, an, an underlying spark, which I think was very important, which was a, a landmark ruling from the European Court of Human Rights in 2010, which pretty well instructed the Irish government to legislate in the light of the referendums that had been held, because they found that one of the uh, complainants, her human rights had been violated because there was no pathway for her to access legal uh, abortion in Ireland. So that when in 2012, um, there was a very tragic death and tragic in the full sense of that word as un an unnecessary death of a young woman, Savita Halapanava, who had come with her husband to Ireland to work and live from India, when she was miscarrying, inevitably miscarrying, and asked the hospital in Ireland that she was in if she could have a, a, a medical termination and abortion. And when she was told that no, she couldn't have that because a fetal heartbeat was detected, and I can hear the bells ringing, not just in the US, but world, worldwide, because a fetal heartbeat was detected and it was a Catholic country, she couldn't have that medical termination. She contracted septicemia and died. And of course, that immediately became public. It was absolutely, I mean, it really was appalling. It deeply, deeply shocked the country as a whole, and people began to pour out onto the streets, expressing their shock and their outrage that this could happen in what we consider to be contemporary, modern, go ahead, progressive country like Ireland, where we felt that we had broken the shackles that had held us in thrall for so long, the shackles of the Catholic Church, but not at all. So that brought that really brought to the surface I think a very deeply, you know, long contained anger at what had been happening and was still happening to women that poured out onto the street, that surge of emotion was instantly the moment when we knew many of us, or some of us at least, that we absolutely had to seize that. People can know things with their heads, but when they know it with their hearts, they are prepared to do something and they were rising up with their hearts and their passions. And it was up to us to seize that moment and begin to mold it into a movement to take the ban out of the constitution for appeal. So we set up our coalition to do that, to repeal the Eighth Amendment, because and my last point now, because I want to hear the others too, uh, really we felt that it was going to be big. This was going to be a really, really, really big movement that we were great in the feminist and pro-choice movements, but we needed everybody in there. And we wanted to also align with, um, and many of us were crossovers in both campaigns. We wanted to align obviously with our LGBT uh, friends and allies and ourselves in their fight for marriage equality. And certainly many of us felt that if we won marriage equality, we would we would be continuing on um, to, to win repeal, which is exactly what happened, which never happens in real life. It's usually only fairy stories, but actually this time it did. Oh, I hope that's catchy. Um, <laughs> all right, um, Catherine, before I move on to Victoria, do you want to add something there? <clears throat> I suppose just two things in light of especially what Elva has been saying, our one of our, our greatest leaders is that firstly, 
I remember so well that moment too, Alva. I was actually inside the doll at the time, our yeah. House of Parliament as a senator. And you and many others were outside the gates and having the most, the biggest rally and protest, I, I think, uh, you know, that had ever yeah. been held uh, or, uh, you know, on, on the issue. And it was, yeah. it was just an extraordinary experience listening to you, my sisters, from inside to the outside. Um, so so that's the first thing. And I, I knew too then that the thing would change. But as you said, and secondly, um, uh, you know, uh, Becky and others, that as Alva's saying is that alongside of this, we were also having a marriage equality campaign. And, um, you, you know, it, 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 it started a number of years ago in early 2000, when I, as, as, as I said earlier, and Louise Gilligan and I took a case against the Irish state to get our, our marriage recognized. And of course, at that stage, and again, going back to I, I, Alva's comments, what was going to happen to Catholic Ireland? what was going to happen to Catholic Ireland. But what I'll say then is that central to our nascent strategy then were two things. And I think they did carry on into uh, the, the work of repeal, but many of us were the same people. Uh, the first one was that rights can be humanized. They're about basic, fundamental things. They're about what human beings want in life. And for us, our primary message was everyone has the right to marry the person they choose to love. Um, and secondly, and you've referred to this, Becky, that stories about people, especially people that the electorate identifies with, can change hearts and minds. Um, but the unfolding strategy centered countless stories of all sorts of different types of folks, diff different by class, ethnicity, race. And our stories normalized us, I think, and, and touched hearts. But the other thing I want to say about stories is that stories reflect contemporary values, and values form the basis of a culture, and a seismic cultural shift for Ireland was underfoot by both the movements. And as Alva said, we won marriage equality in 2015, and then three years later, repeal. Oh, I, this is like pouring salve into my soul. Wow, <laughs> this is so, so good. And thank you both. And not, it is unfortunate that it often takes horrifying and unimaginable, unimaginable yeah. circumstances to humanize the devastating impact, uh, impact of these bans. Um, Victoria, I know it was a similar case in Argentina where tragedies reinvigorated the debate around abortion. Can you tell us a little bit about what led to the country legalizing abortion in 2020? Yes, I think there are many points uh, that led us to legal abortion. I, I think uh, an important point was to launch uh, the national campaign for legal abortion in 2005 uh, we realized as activists that abortion was, was such a tough issue that we needed a specific space to be organized around it. So we launched the national campaign for legal abortion what, and the scarves, <laughs> our symbol, <laughs> and with a slogan, which, is, uh, which was uh, sexual education to decide contraception not to have an abortion and legal abortion not to die. And we used that slogan to convince more people and to join another movements and another organizations and to build a national and federal uh, network uh, that could construct a bill to take as a movement to take it to the Congress. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a very important point. And another one was a very hard situation we were, <laughs> we, we faced, that was the name of um, the Pope, the Argentinian Pope <laughs> in 2013. So we can probably say that uh, feminist uh, activists in Argentina changed the position of the Vatican around abortion. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, when Francisco was named, uh, that was a very hard moment for the feminists in Argentina. And so we all joined together. We were suddenly stronger and all our difference uh, inside the movement just go away. <laughs> so that was very important turning points for us. And the last one, I think, um, <clears throat> Starting point was the new namenos uh, that we can compare to the women's march in, in the U.S. is something that 
you are many years trying to construct a public agenda and the feminist agenda is some is, is a tough agenda to to put into the public uh scenery and then into the uh press and into the television and the public opinion in a massive way so uh the nuna menos movement um <clears throat> nuna menos event help us to position the feminist agenda in the highest uh, place uh, that we never imagined uh, we could we could do. So uh, I think so many years working and working and thinking and strategizing just led us to a turning point that all of a sudden changed all the agenda in Argentina, in, in the region, and I think in the world, because as Becky said, we, we are all connect and we were looking at you uh, when when the Women's March and the Me Too movement, and I think there's something more uh, international happening happening with our agendas. Yes. yes, I love it. I love it, Victoria. I'm seeing a <clears throat> excuse me a new outfit coming together. The pink hats from the uh, Women's yes. March with the green scarves. <laughs> yes. I think I think we can we can do it. Um, because the what went on in Argentina and Latin America really, you know, was a beacon for for the world, and it's really so important for us to see powerfully, visually, the movement band together in that way. So, JJ, I'd like to pull you into this. Um, uh, so, Roe v. Wade overturned three months ago. Yeah, we call that a spark. Um, and the ramifications are definitely being felt around the country. I'd love to get your thoughts on whether this was really what we needed to push the movement into a bigger and bolder place. Um, as we often hear our colleagues say, Roe v. Wade wasn't um, the goal. Uh, so, you know, now we've gone backwards yeah. further. So talk to us a little bit more about um, what we should be hoping for at this moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, as our colleagues here have said, like abortion is not limited by the borders of a state or a country um, and, and neither is our demand um, to, to be equal in our societies, right? And so um, it, it's hard to say, Becky, um, that this was the wake up call that maybe we needed, but honestly, um, the outpouring of energy, just like you guys have said, mm -hmm. uh, that we have seen, and honestly, as somebody who's been working in this for a, quite, a, quite a long time in my life, I think that what we faced um, in this country was a disbelievability, right? Like, oh, JJ, this isn't going to happen. You're exaggerating. They're not really going to take away abortion or birth control or gay marriage. Um, and I think that what we've seen since the leak, actually, we had a leak of the decision, as you guys might remember, um, a few weeks before the actual decision came out. And I think that that was an earthquake moment, right, for a lot of folks, including people who are very much, um, you know, involved and, you know, voters and activists, but they could not believe that we were gonna go backwards um, to that degree. And we have seen an outpouring, people in the streets. Um, the voter reg numbers, you all, the voter registration numbers that we're seeing in this country that uh, I don't wanna say are spontaneous, but it's the best way for me to describe them of somebody who has spent years running programs to see people flocking and registering to vote um, in record numbers. And it's uh, mostly women under 30 uh, across the US. I think we have seen, this is not a partisan issue, probably much like it is in your countries. This has nothing to do with politics for people. This is literally their very uh, own autonomy and liberty. So we are seeing folks who regardless of their backgrounds, their religion, really step up and demand a different day in this country. Um, at the same time, Becky, we also have seen an incredible rollback, right? Like as I sit here today, 18 states since June um, have either severe restrictions or complete bans in place, which means that those that the folks in those states cannot access abortion care, um, period. 
And that is been devastating. And as you all have said, I think the stories have been what have driven people's passion to this. The stories of, I, I wanna say the intended consequences, not the unintended consequences. The stories of intended consequences of the very small minority of people who are making these decisions for us have been compelling and really have See, we've seen an outpouring, like I said, of folks who have become involved, including in the ACLU. Becky, as you know, we had 30,000 folks sign up to become activists within a few days who joined us for our abortion activist series. We saw 30,000 folks in Michigan sign up to be volunteers. We saw the record number of signatures gathered to put a referendum in the Michigan state constitution. Um, we have seen the Kansas election, um, which was just an absolutely unexpected um, outpouring of folks in a primary election in our country where folks normally aren't even paying attention, come to the polls and make sure their voice was heard. And that's what we're gonna build upon, including all the great work that's being done with our brothers and sisters across the, the world. Can I, can I just say that, Becky, really very quickly? It's yeah. so interesting, JJ, when you say, you know, that you've seen younger, younger women in particular registering to vote, for example. I think that happened with us because the death of Savita really galvanized um, young women in particular, young men a bit, but certainly young women. And they're in, and I think they, I think the young women in the States understand that they're in this for the long haul and they're the ones who are going to be to be there when certainly my generation is is gone, you know, are, are no longer out there on the streets, although I'll have to be dragged off screaming. But I, I mean, I do I do think that that's so important and working with all of those younger women and the same in Argentina where you had so many young women, that's that's what's been so immensely encouraging in often very dark days. And I hope it is for you in the States at the moment. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry, Becky. It, no, you I think it's absolutely incredible. And, and, you know, I'll admit, I think we were all a little worried about that because there's this notion that if it's your birthright, and we go backwards, maybe it wouldn't be as galvanizing, but I'm so glad to be wrong. And we have seen absolutely no, like, I think that's the actual motivators. Like, wait a minute, I should have the same rights um, that certainly my grandmothers and mothers um, fought mm -hmm. for. And, um, and that this is just a human right period and that everybody should have it across the world. Yeah. It's, it's so true. I think, um, there's something about the outpouring, the, the obviously the voter um, registration indicator is great. And then there are just a lot of people who want to tell their abortion stories now, yeah. which is so mm -hmm. important. I think somehow realizing that this is personal, you know, like it, it wasn't mm -hmm. just something that was at the real out there, but now it's landed personally for the realities of many of us. And showcasing the human centric stories is super powerful. And um, the real life impact. So it's not just, you know, percentages and, and yeah. ratios. It's, it's real life stories of what cruel bans mean um, all across the country. And that's what we needed, I think, to bolster this movement. And as you all know, there are different tactics and approaches to telling these stories, but I think it's worth us diving a little bit deeper into that topic of the need to reframe the issue and tell our stories. So I'd like to, you know, I mean, when the ACLU enters the abortion debate, we typically center the principles of liberty and equality. Um, and that may move some, <laughs> but it it is, we're finding not enough all the time to move those in the middle of the aisle on this issue. And some who are just sitting on the sidelines who need convincing that it's worth their time and energy. So messaging this work is a careful balancing act when you're dealing with voters, religious institutions, uh, politicians, and policymakers. So I'd love to surface some of the tactics taken in Ireland and Argentina that moved and persuaded the public. And Catherine, I'm thinking we'll start with you. Okay, um, thank you, Becky. Uh, and, and and just to say to to JJ and you too, you know, I was with, and I was with uh, Irish women, English women at the time of Roe, and you know, their hearts were pouring out for you, and we're wondering was the American dream just kind of unraveling because women are so integral to that. So, but very much with you. Um, 
you know, uh, indeed, in 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 Ireland, um, you know, as a politician, um, uh, as an insider, uh, I really leveraged that role in a couple of day, ways, and I'm going to just speak about one of them now because I I think it we used uh, the mechanism that was utilized. I think was very integral to uh, our ultimately our success. Um, just after being um, elected, uh, I was elected as an independent. I wasn't a member of a party uh, to our lower house in early 2016. I entered into negotiations with our um, the party that had the most seats, but they didn't have enough to govern uh, to see, you know, would I be willing to support them? But I, one of my red line issues was that I, I, I would only vote for the government, that, that party to, to form a government if, if they established what we called a citizens assembly. Uh, that's a form of deliberative democracy. And it, it is a form of deliberative democracy, but I wanted to have it established in terms of the abortion issue. The political party, which was very socially and economically conservative, absolutely did not want to do that um, initially. Way too contentious. But I said, that's the point, I argued, because structured deliberations with citizens could mediate through contention, I believed, and that we had used this mechanism actually in the marriage equality a campaign. Um, another contentious issue at the time, um, 100 citizens were randomly selected. Um, they gathered several times to consider the issue of marriage equality. They listened to experts. They heard the stories. Um, but they were working with people who were unlike them, who had different perspectives. The, they were facilitated to deliberate having listened to those different perspectives and talked and negotiated in an open and civilized manner. And many of them changed their minds. The other thing is that the it was a media, uh, it was live stream. So the public was being educated too. Uh, the assembly rec recommended to government that they should hold a referendum on marriage equality. The government accepted that recommendation um, and also decided to campaign for it. So I believed that the same thing could happen with abortion. The political party finally accepted my argument. Um, so uh, they had my vote to form a government then. Uh, the government was formed. I was, I, I was uh, lucky enough to be appointed a member, a senior minister in the cabinet. And I'll speak a little bit later about what else, uh, how I leveraged that role. But that was a key mechanism, I think, the Citizens Assembly. I love that. I mean, what a novel concept, listening, learning from other people. I mean, who, who would have thought in a democracy? How, how lovely. Um, and, you know, I love that you also brought up the, the intersectionality of the different issues. Um, and because I know JJ works a lot on this since we are a multi-issue organization. Um, Alva, is there anything you wanted to add about the role of storytelling? I think that, you know, our main message was not about human rights. It was actually about health care. It was saying abortion is health care. Women need care. Women need abortion. Women need care. So we shifted the whole narrative, if you like, away from the terrain of morality, which is where the, um, the anti-abortion people like to keep it. We shifted it over from morality over to health care. We didn't ever shift rights, but we emphasize need far more than rights. This is something that women and people who are pregnant who want an abortion, it's what they actually need. And in doing that, we also shifted it away from that anti-abortion terrain of the fetus to focus on a woman. What is it that a woman needs in her life in order to flourish? And of course, once you do that, you have the stories, you have the bearing witness. You are saying this is ordinary and everyday. It's saying to people, you have to change the way you're looking. You have to change the lens and not see it from that perspective, perspective but from the woman's perspective. And that also means you've got to give up judgment. You've got to say bye-bye judgment. We are actually going to try and put ourselves in the shoes of another person who wants to do something that we might not want to do, but does she need that? Let me walk in her shoes. So that led us to compassion. So we had three C's, care, <laughs> compassion, and change. And I always said there is a fourth C there, but we never really talked about it very much. And the fourth C, of course, was choice. Mm -hmm. But in fact, if you actually say it's healthcare, that's it. That is your argument. And just one last point, my own favorite sort of uh, photo op was a whole bunch of women 
all kinds of women, different ethnicities and ages and all sorts, outside a row of very ordinary little Irish Dublin houses. And they were just gazing up at the camera saying, she lives on your street. Mm. So this is about everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Men, women, children, everybody. Yes, so I think that was very key for us, along with all of the other dimensions, of course, but it was a, a real core. And we fed that into the citizen, Citizens Assembly that Catherine has um, spoken about so eloquently. I love that. I'm, I'm developing a new mantra. Goodbye, judgment. Hello, empathy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Victoria, I saw you nodding a lot. So can you talk a lot about, or can you share with us about how the movement in Argentina um, push the public to understand abortion as a human right? Because you had to sustain that for 15 years. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, there are many similar uh, things with, with other countries. Um, I think the coalition build, building was a key, sure, a key, something very important. And then uh, to construct different strategies for different groups and different messages for different groups. But we can say there were three key messages that we uh, identify for the Argentinian context, right? Uh, one of them was to position abortion as a public health issue, as a public health uh, problem. Mm -hmm. And that uh, was something very different because when, when we started abortion in the in this in society was positioned as something that link was linked to murder so yes. we have to change that culture of abortion like linked to murder so um, abortion as a healthcare issue abortion as a social justice issue why women who has the money and has the social position to have access to a secure abortion don't uh, they, they don't, don't uh, risk their life in a clandestine abortion and poor women risk their life and die in an abortion in my country so um, the social justice uh, argument was something that was very strong here uh, and I think that it, that could be linked to the U.S. context because how unfair is it to, if you have more or less rights according on where in which uh, state you are born, <laughs> how crazy is that? Um, and then uh, the, the argument of human rights, abortion as a human rights. Uh, the human rights movement here is very, very strong. Uh, so, uh, to position abortion uh, as a human rights was a key for us mm -hmm. to join the human rights organization support uh, the women's issue and the legal abortions issue. So I think that was uh, very, very, very important too for us. And mm -hmm. then to uh, distinguish this, uh, to make a difference uh, with different groups, such to construct arguments to the politicians, to construct arguments to the public opinion and yes. common public, and then to construct uh, arguments to the healthcare providers, mm -hmm. uh, to study the statistics, to study all the, all the numbers and to study <laughs> the issue and know all of, of that for every province, for every, mm -hmm. For every space. Yes. And, and JJ, I wanted to um, pull you in to talk a little bit briefly because it's I'm hearing a lot of similarities to what um, the approaches we're taking here in the US. So can you talk a little bit about the messaging that is striking at the hearts and minds of, um, of the um, folks who are situated more in the middle of the discussions? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I I love what's being said here because I will say that um, as Becky has shared and as she and I have spent a lot of hours together in our own organization thinking about, you know, and, and you both started with what, you know, the striking point is. It really is stories mm -hmm. that are really, when you said she lives on your street, like that, it really is just, you know, the everyday stories of how this is affecting yes. everyone. This is not, you know, a discreet, tiny thing. This is really about um, folks' entire lives. Um, and at the same time, Victoria, as you just said, we have to think about the different audiences. Um, and what has been really compelling right away has been for us, um, 
uh, as Becky has shared, what we've done in our organization around forced pregnancy, like really bringing it down to the notion that folks aren't going to be able to have their own self-determination about something that is so um, huge in our lives, you know, a center point, um, as well as just how cruel and awful our opponents have been in this moment, um, and really speaking into the microphone how they feel about us, like I said about the Supreme Court decision. And at the same time, uh, we know that folks approach this very differently. And one of the things that has really um, come to bear in states like Kansas and uh, where we're working deeply right now in Kentucky and, and I sit here in Colorado, which is kind of in the middle, um, is really about our personal freedoms and our autonomy and who makes this decision. And I think yeah. that what we are seeing over and over, and, and you said this a little bit too, Albie, is like, this is a decision that should not sit in the government. However you personally feel about it, whatever your personal religion is, whatever your personal values are, yeah. we all are seeing broad agreement that folks that sit in Washington or sit in our gilded capitals are not the ones who should be deciding that. It should yes. be individuals with their healthcare providers because this is healthcare and that no one should be empowered to make that decision for anyone else, particularly um, in light of how this has affected um, you know, people's very ability to live, as you guys have all noted, like the, the again, intended consequences that we are seeing are very, are, are whether people may live or die. Um, and as you said, Victoria, in your country, who has access and who is at greatest risk. And those things I think have been extremely compelling, including to those who absolutely Becky, we've seen this, who will start out their own um, testimony or testifying with, I am personally against abortion. However, I yes. should not be deciding for my daughter, my friend, my neighbor. This should be a personal decision, period. It is not a political decision. And as you guys have noted, I think people here are also tired of it. And they're yeah. tired of politicians in mm -hmm. particular mm -hmm. using this as a wedge between us all. And that's where I think we're seeing just the start of groundswell of that. Like, this is not up to you. This is up to us. And you need to get out of this base. Um, and I hope that that's what we are able to continue to build on, along with all the great wisdom you all are sharing of how you were able to sustain and think about talking to folks. And, and I love that point um, that you made at the end, JJ, because it's a great transition to our next topic, because stories are one component of an important multifaceted strategy, because as you've all acknowledged, this could be decades, right? Like we could be in this for many years. So we need, you know, multiple overlapping strategies to really shift our politics and our policies towards the values that really reflect the will of the people. We've gotten out of step with the, with the will of the people. So I wanted to shift a, a bit to that, to defining and measuring progress over time to keep you know everyone, keep the energy up. Um, in the 50 years after Roe v. Wade, the opposition in the States immediately got to work to incrementally chip away at Roe. And they kept, you know, they were doggedly steadfast with the goal of overturning the ruling. So they started by winning at the local and state levels with yes. Senate seats and Congress yes. members and DAs and state Supreme Court justices. And they chipped away at the right via restrictions, whether they were partial or outright bans until they won at the Supreme Court. So we similarly need to play a long game. So I want everyone in on this segment and um, JJ, maybe we'll start with you this time. Oh, so, <laughs> okay. So um, for just let's, let's like get our orientation here. As yeah. we plan and we look ahead, what is our North Star? Um, it's a great question, Becky, because I do think particularly you guys, and I'm sure these moments have happened to you as well, like after Dobbs, um, we actually like kind of went into mourning a little bit, I would say, like it was so, um, no matter how you expect something like that, and, and I think we expected it for sure, and with the leak, obviously we had even a preview, but it was very hard, um, and I think that this landscape of what is next is even harder because I, people want an instant remedy um, where one obviously isn't going to exist. And I, for me, Becky, my North Star, and I think for the ACLU and our activists and everyone is like, 
we need we now know based on that supreme court decision that we need to explicitly put ourselves back in this us constitution period how we do that there's a myriad of ways and i think that we're going to work together to figure out how to do that um, whether it is, you know, a constitutional uh, amendment or um, or work in the states or, um, you know, a 50 state strategy. And probably it's going to be some intersection of all of those things, to be honest. But what we really need to do is uh, continue to work immediately at the state level to protect access and expand it where we can and make sure those who are most affected um, have, yes. that we're helping aid them get that, the care that they need. And then at the same time, doing what my colleagues here did, which is like, the culture is ahead of our politicians. Like this is us going backwards. There's no doubt about that. And, and we need to continue, I think, to really think about how we are uh, speaking to, to folks um, in those stories and across um, whatever political divides or whatever we have, continuing to break down the stigma, which we've worked really hard on in this country, and, and you guys have mentioned as well, um, by really talking about um, what abortion is and what it isn't, um, that it is healthcare, that, um, that, it's, uh, that it affects many, many people um, across the board. Um, and I think most importantly, Becky, and, and building on what others have said, I think we just need to know that it is a generational fight and that even when we win, the fight does not stop, right? Like we are, we are change makers. We are here because we are going to continually fight for a better world. And there's, when I get asked like, what's the thing I can do? I'm like, you can show up and do as much as you can. And there's multiple ways to engage. But the truth is, is that there's no moment that I can give you that's just gonna change things overnight. This is always going to be us coming together and fighting for the better world we want and using our intersectional um, uh, movement tactics and learnings from each other to continue to push that progress forward so that we have access to health care. We get to marry who we want. Everybody, uh, no matter what their gender um, is, has access to health care and full autonomy and full employment. We have a clean, healthy environment for our future. You know, these are all things that are about that better world. And uh, we're all going to fight for them together. And I think um, I will also say, though, in the very short term, we have uh, an election coming up in November, and we've already seen that elections can be a collective moment where we send a giant signal, right? Like, and that's coming up uh, in just uh, a few few short weeks here. Um, and we have already seen from the primaries that we can collectively send that signal. And you know how I know it's working? All the folks that were proud to go in the microphone a few months ago are now like scrubbing their records and saying, no, no, we didn't mean that we'll ban it nationally. Oh, really? You've said that for 10 years. All of a sudden, you're not saying that? We have abilities to send these giant signals in a democracy that we need to continue to send that this is not the world that we are going to live in or stand for. And if you are not with us and you're not here to represent us, then I guess it's time for you to pack your bags, right? So we know that coming up in November, uh, we need to vote our values. We also need to vote to show that democracy is important to us in this country because those, you know, that is something that is really uh, unfortunately under debate in this country. And those are the giant signals that we can send as well as pouring into the streets, being activists, talking to our legislators, talking to our friends and family. We have these national moments and we need to harness them to send the biggest signals that we can. And I'm, I'm excited about uh, what's to come. It's gonna be hard, but we're gonna do it together. And that's what's most important. So hearing, you know, quite clearly that our North Star is to be situated like our friends in Ireland and our and our friend here in Argentina with federally protected access to abortion care. We need to see what the roadmap looks like from our friends here. So Alva, I'm going to start with you and see if you can share with us what some of the early milestones were that that signaled that you were on the path. Well, I mean, I do think actually that um, 
you know, being able to form a cohesive group and to build mm. that kind of cohesion was actually really very important. So I know that in the early days we had something like 12 organizations. Please bear in mind I'm a small country, but 12 was small even for a small country. So but when we got to 20, it was good. And when we got to 50, it was a big milestone and 100 was huge. Um, so th there was something of that kind, actually getting everybody to agree to um, the findings of our research and therefore to completely revise our, our messaging so that our primary placards were not reading pro-choice, they were actually reading something a little bit different, which was something like abortion is care or abortion is health care. There, there, there were things like that. There were also, of course, all of the practical issues of building around the country, because I, I do think, and, and JJ really has alluded to it, is that you absolutely have to get local groups. So in the states, which is so vast, you're only going to beat this if you're doing it state by state. Um, and then it becomes an overall national thing, but it is building all those states now that are strong, uh, who and then building in this, the states that actually need uh, the strengthening. I love centering it on that. And and Victoria, I'm coming next to you and then and you after that, Catherine, on the same question of milestones that were early indicators that you were on the right um, progress path. You can never relax in women's <laughs> movement. <laughs> never relax. So I think uh, it was very important for us, the network building, like to be connected, uh, to be organized all around the country, in every state, and at the national level, both levels. At the national level in, and in every state has their, to have strong groups. Think about strategies in every state. So uh, I think that is very important, uh, free, legal, and safe. <laughs> we totally agree. And I think, um, yes, to build coalition and to join more uh, groups and to join more people uh, and to convince more people uh, about the importance on legal abortion and to build a strategy in every, in every state. Uh, that was very, very important for us and to let, let us to, to legal abortion, to, to legal abortion. I think it's very important to, to build um, networks. That yes. was key for us. Yeah. And, yes. and Catherine, how about you, your thoughts on- Thank you. Outcomes? Yes, um, and, and to say, first of all, JJ, I will follow you. <laughs> I will follow the ACLU. <laughs> Victoria, you're absolutely right. You can never relax. And Elva, you know, hey, everyone, I mean, look at her radical spirit. I mean, that's no, it's no, it's no accident she was our leader. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to say one thing here. I suppose, again, just going back to my role as a politician on being on the inside. And actually, by the way, um, you know, I'm on the inside. Elva's on the outside in this one. And But every Sunday morning, we had a chat. We had a conversation. <laughs> and we didn't share secrets, but we did just get a sense of the temperature of what was going on. And... Um, just one of the things I wanted to share in terms of the inside, inside and how I, have, you know, I at the stage I was there, I was at the cabinet table. So I decided to, to leverage that role. Um, I spent a lot there, the, you know, the Citizens Assembly had recommended that we should have um, a, a referendum, um, but the government still had to agree to that and, and whether or not we were going to all collectively, uh, you know, campaign for it. So I prepared for that meeting very well to, to uh, uh, you know, for us to make that decision. And actually, I managed to find my notes for it. Um, uh, I decided to focus actually on the ethical argument. I, I heard Alva in terms of the morality, but I thought on the outside. But on the inside, um, my colleagues had all been raised Catholic and I had the tools of a theologian. And so my argument then to th that, that cabinet meeting, and it picks up on some of the things like, you know, JJ, you're saying is that, you know, who should make this decision? And so I was saying, my argument was then and still is women and others who are deciding about a reproductive issues, that we are moral agents, that a pregnant person has a moral life, that they are embedded in relationships of support, care, and love, that we have agency, that we're a member of a community, and we hold the power to make the right decision about our reproductive health. We hold the power to make the right decision about carrying a pregnancy to full term. We hold the power to 
make the right decision about terminating a pregnancy and to decide when, um, when to do, when to have children and how many. Um, that we have a conscience. There's no culture that doesn't kind of situate conscience as integral. That in fact, conscience is super integral to the whole ethical making process of for Catholicism. Um, so our laws should enable that human capacity to flourish, especially, though not only for those who are pregnant. Um, uh, others contributed to the cabinet meeting too, but we, we, we ended the meeting deciding to put a referendum to the people and to campaign as one voice um, for freedom and justice. Oh, I got chills. Anyone else? Uh, and yeah, yeah, yes, I can just add that uh, national elections are a huge opportunity for us. Uh, every national elections, we try to get together with the with the candidates, with our politicians, to yes. say, well, get. Uh, we want to know what do you think about our project. Well, we want to know your position about abortion. We want to know if you're going to to stand for our rights. We want to know what are you going to do to defend our rights and what you, <laughs> we want you to sign a compromise with us that yes. you are going to take our our goals to the Congress. So um, that was a huge opportunity and we need to work on that. I feel so I said this before, but now I feel even more replenished after this conversation. And I feel that it's only fair since you've given us so much that we have an opportunity to give in return. So in this last segment, before we close, I I'm hoping that you'll all share with us something that you're working on now in an area that we can support you. Um, because you you know you've got a great audience here, and we all know we're passionate. So, how, what is it that you need from us? And Alva, I'll start with you, and then I'll go to you, Victoria, and then you, uh, Catherine. Well, it is very, very, very rare <laughs> for Ireland <laughs> to say to a very large country like the United States of America, maybe we can help you more at this point. And maybe you are the people who really need that. And I, I just wanted to say that I know that there is massive love and solidarity in Ireland. Everybody, everybody feels for you, but everybody also wants to help you. And in a way, I think the best thing that we can do is to keep pushing all of us together for that sense of international connection, because there is no doubt what you do really matters to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So we want you mm -hmm. to be able to enjoy those rights and freedom that you're entitled to. And I think we can help one another. But I would say to you, if you have anything spare to give, turn it inwards just for the moment and focus on getting your house really in order and strengthen, strengthen, strengthen your democracy because that is so important. And we're all rooting for you. You know, I constantly am sending spirit across the Atlantic and thinking, I hope it reaches, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> because to hold your hands and to be with you. Well, I, I know it's reaching me, so thank you. Um, <laughs> Victoria, how about you? I think uh, we, we need to support each other and the solidarity. Uh, the, the international solidarity was very important uh, yeah. to legalize abortion in Argentina because we received a lot of messages and letters and uh, different activities in the Argentinian embassies. Uh, so that was very important for us. And now we are facing a very, a very um, hard uh, issue around uh, women's rights. Uh, that we discovered after uh, the legalization of abortion that the justice had a strategy to put women, young women uh, that had abortions in jail. There are uh, around uh, 1,500 women in all our country that are in jail for having an abortion. And so it was not a surprise for Argentinian uh, activists what do you, what happened in the US with the courts, because we are having a huge problem with justice. And this is something that we need to get involved and to think together strategies to overcome and to build better democracies. So we want to be connected and have uh, solidarity from us and from we, from two. <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> Okay, and Catherine? 
Yeah, I, I, I echo the sentiments of what Vic, Victoria just said, and of course, Alva uh, as well, so beautifully put. Um, I'm now located in the United States. Um, one of the things I'm doing, I suppose, is encouraging actually the idea of some form of citizens assembly uh, to be conducted uh, at state level in the United States. Uh, there have been a couple of experiments here, but of course, the Irish uh, playbook has been very effective. And strong, but as as we all know, we're at some point in America. We are at a point in American history where we have to find ways to enable debate and dialogue and decision yeah. across stark divides. Um, and I think it also offers citizens a way to engage in direct opportunities uh, to make a difference. And of course, ACLU are so great at doing that. Um, uh, so uh, it, it could be established in one or a few states where they could make recommendations to a governor or to state or some uh, legislatures um, for regular or legislative sessions to expand or protect abortion access. So, um, and secondly, I've also done some recent work with the UNFPA. Alva actually assisted me with some of that. UN's um, Secretary and Reproductive Health and Rights Agency and making recommendations actually for them to facilitate global and regional space to build a coalition of progressive religious forces to meet the strength of the conservative religious forces who of course are good at influencing people's choices about reproductive health. Um, and I'm um, so, so those are some of the things I'm working on presently. Hmm. Oh, I love that. I'll have to get my feminist the theology book off the shelf. <laughs> um, all right. So JJ, um, since we are speaking to um, the leaders of the uh, ACLU uh, community, can you give us one thing for this audience to work on? Uh, absolutely. Um, I mentioned it earlier. We are, um, you know, within weeks of uh, a national moment and uh, and we have seen an incredible surge in folks um, registering to vote. It's one thing to register to vote. It's another to, you know, to, to vote, to turn into a voter. Um, and what I would encourage folks to do is to make sure, first of all, always check if you're registered to vote. I think that um, different states have different rules around this and, and folks can be surprised on election day. So check now and make sure that you are registered to vote in your state. Make sure that your friends and family are all, that you have those conversations now, put that date on the calendar, make it as important for me as my birthday uh, or for whatever your favorite holiday is. Make voting as important as your favorite holiday. Make sure when you promote your favorite holiday, you promote it to your friends and family, to your coworkers, to everybody. Um, and then making sure that, that you are really announcing using social media, using direct conversations, using everything we have um, to, really, to really turn out um, here in the next few weeks and send that very, very clear message um, to those who want to put a national ban into the United States that that is not acceptable. There's some states that also have ballot measures, make sure you're turning out to vote for those um, if you live in one of those states. Um, and then most importantly, I would say, um, make sure that, uh, that you're having every day the kind of conversations like we're having today when you have those opportunities. We are only going to beat this back by continuing to put it at the forefront of why it's important and how it's affecting us and sharing our own personal stories when we can, sharing um, with our friends and family, and really um, continuing to send clear message about the world we want, because that's what we're here to fight for. Here, here. All here. right. So, um, <laughs> As I begin to close us out, I first want to thank you, Alva. I want to thank you, Catherine, you, Victoria, and you, JJ, for taking the time to be in conversation and community with all of us today. Restoring abortion rights in the states will be a long battle. But as we heard from our guests, there is power in numbers, in strategy, in partnerships, and in rallying the masses. Collectively, we do have a lot of work ahead of us, but knowing that we have such incredible sources of inspiration and hope brings me a bit of relief <laughs> and restore, you know, so it does some restorative work here. We are in this together. And to you, the audience, I wanna thank you for spending this time with us today. If you have any outstanding questions, please email us at leadershipforum at aclu.org. In times like these, I am so grateful for this ACLU community and my new global community. 
And with our vast presence across the nation, including all of you, our staff, our US partners, and our international partners, we are stronger together. And we are so grateful to have all of you in this fight with us.